Hello everybody, welcome back, my name is Stefan, and today we're going to be covering part 2 of the overwhelming Paradox Empire. Now if you're not aware what this empire is, it's a fanatic egalitarian slaver build. In case you have not watched episode 1, uh, the way this empire works is we have syncretic evolution, uh, so that we have a secondary species, and we also have xenophobe, so that we can actually enslave that secondary species. Uh, that way we have a productive underclass while also being meritocratic, egalitarian, and just and righteous. Uh, of course, that just and righteousness is completely up to you. That is a bit of an RP aspect of this build. Uh, there is a more efficient version of this build, uh, where you would take meritocracy as your second pick. Uh, with this version of the build, you have a very, very significant technological edge, and you also get access to meritocracy once you get your third civic, which will not take long, because with technocracy, uh, research and uh, unity output is extremely easy, and you can just stroll through the game and uh, win. Overall, this build is one of the easiest to play in that regard. There is one regard, however, that is a little more difficult, and that is micromanagement in the mid game, and that is exactly what I'm going to show you today. And so, without further ado, let's just hop into the save and uh, I'll show you some strategy. Now, this is the Empire 50 years down the line. This is, of course, the same Empire as we've had uh, in the previous video, and as you can see here, we have expanded a little bit. Uh, it is now year 50, and uh, our borders and everything else are looking quite fine. We have quite decent stations with a sufficient amount of defenses uh, in case a war happens. Uh, however, if you're really, really feeling a threat, you might want to have a little fleet around. Uh, speaking of fleet, there's actually an early game strategy that I want to show you guys. Uh, this strategy allows you to get 140 alloys right at the start of the game, uh, which is pretty much equivalent to a science ship and a scientist. And uh, the way you accomplish this is you go into ship designer, get a naked corvette by just, you know, unequipping everything. You simply right click on a module to unequip it. And then you also unequip the jump drive by just, you know, making sure there's no jump drive. Uh, then you save the ship and then you're ready to retrofit all your vessels. You can simply go ahead and retrofit to the naked class and by upgrading you will get a certain amount of alloys. Uh, I do have some modifiers on ship upgrade cost and uh, that is why these numbers are a little bit off but generally you can very safely rely on 140 alloys at the start of the game. And with this, you're able to purchase a science ship and generally a scientist. Afterwards, you will be left with a couple naked corvettes, which you can uh, just repurpose later. Uh, there's two general ways that you can use these. One is by simply having them around and upgrading them to a normal design later. The second one is a little bit more interesting. Uh, this is a war strategy that I'll be showing off later, but basically what you can do is you can create a little breadcrumb trail. Uh, when you have no FTL blocker in the very early game, uh, some fleets may actually be able to avoid your station and just sneak past you. However, with this strategy, they will be forced to engage your corvettes and uh, engage, 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 and get to the station. Uh, by the way, the strategy works with virtually any ships, uh, including science ships, so you can also just, uh, you know, mask your scientists for the good of the state. Uh, but moving on to the mid game, uh, planet management is where things get a little hectic. Uh, as a normal empire, you would have your normal species, uh, maybe a population that you conquer from an enemy that you maybe keep on a single planet, and robots. In this case, you have three populations to manage. Uh, you have your robots, you have your enslaved population, and you have your regular population. Uh, for example, this planet is not balanced properly. What you want is something more along the lines of this, where most of the workers are the slave pops and maybe some robots. Uh, robots are generally good as farmers, um, I modify them to have the extra farm output trait, and that is so that they're somewhat useful and uh, don't get their jobs stolen by the slaves. Uh, there's a problem that may occur sometimes, uh, if the slaves are too efficient, uh, they will replace robots in certain jobs, and you may be left in a situation where robots are just unemployed. You just have 8 unemployed robots and uh, just a bunch of technician farmers. And then, for example, no clerks. Uh, in those situations, you just uh, go ahead and uh, make the slaves less efficient by enabling domestic protocols. Obviously, this may not apply to everyone that's playing this build, uh, but in case this does, you pretty much know what I'm talking about. And speaking of rights, uh, domestic servitude is actually not that bad, even when you're talking about just a regular population with no unemployment problems. And that is because domestic servitude allows you to have extra servant pops. So if you don't have enough jobs on your planets, you can just enable domestic servitude and all of these burbs will just work for you as servants. Uh, these pops will produce 5 monies each and have reduced housing requirements. And that is quite good so you can have just a bunch of domestic servants around and not experience any problems. 
Uh, one other thing that you might want to use is Lifestock. And Lifestock is actually incredibly useful. Uh, it's basically a purge without the problems of a purge. Uh, the pops are not going to be too happy with you nibbling on their toes once in a while. However, they will not decline and they will also reproduce and grow new pops. So you will not have any problems there. Uh, let me just demonstrate the Lifestock for you. Set species rights to crash the economy. Alright, so as you can see here, Lifestock pops are pretty efficient. Uh, they all produce four base food, however in the late game you can boost this up to eight. Uh, you can get pretty crazy, you can pretty much get a purge pops worth of output just from a Lifestock pop. And these pops don't even consume a lot of housing. Uh, all they need is 0.25 per pop, and they don't take up any jobs. So you can just have a bunch of them on a single planet without any problems whatsoever. Uh, it's not advisable to do this early on because you would be depriving yourselves of uh, valuable pops. However, later on, uh, it might be very useful to just, you know, put a population on livestock and just not have to worry about them. Uh, these pops still do have some political power and they are somewhat represented, but their representation is quite low in your society. And even though everyone is equal and uh, technically has a say, these guys have a weighted say of 2% to, you know, the output of the planet. Uh, it's pretty crazy you can get away with a lot of livestock pops and in fact this is one of the strategies that might make habitats great again you just plop a bunch of livestock on your habitat and you just watch them grow and produce food uh, filling habitats with livestock is extremely efficient and uh, you can get a lot of special buildings on the habitats without having to worry about you know putting actual pops on there uh, as far as other aspects of a general strategy go uh, you will also have to manage your planets uh, planet development is actually a little bit easier than you might think all I do in this build is just plop a nice little robot assembly plan down and just watch all the pops happen and uh, all the growth malices from not having enough pops just completely disappear. Uh, if you're not aware, there's a growth malice that is applied to the first 10 pops on your new colony and uh, by getting to 10 pops, you can negate that growth malice. Uh, there are only three ways of actually circumventing it. One is to play hive mind. Hive minds just simply don't have that problem. Uh, two is to resettle pops. Uh, this might be easier in the late game where you can actually afford to resell pops from your productive worlds. However, in the early game, you generally don't have the pops to make this worthwhile. And the third option is to build robots. Robots are extremely good. They grow at a rate of two per month base. Uh, you can increase this even further with uh, rapid assembly, uh, which increases it to 2.3 per month. And uh, these guys really help you out with growing your planets early on. Uh, building robots first will pretty much double the pop growth in your colony from five to 10 pops and uh, it'll help you significantly in averting some of the malice from having a colony with a low amount of pops. Uh, once you do get to 10 pops, however, there's a lot more customizability. Some planets may become tech worlds. Uh, in this build, you generally want to go for as many research labs as possible, and so some planets would just have the robot assembly plant and a bunch of research labs. Uh, other planets may just be your consumer worlds, where you just produce a bunch of TVs and supply the researchers to do something with them. Other worlds still will be low habitability, and a pain in the ass for the colonists. On these planets, amenities are a problem, and there are two ways of going about it. Either you build a nice little holo theater, or you go ahead and boost your amenity production in other ways. Uh, for example, with this empire, we have the charismatic trait, which increases the amenities produced by the leaders by quite a significant margin. Uh, there's also clerk jobs, which are handy, but are not efficient enough to really warrant them. And then there's also the servants. Uh, besides jobs, there's also decisions that go into it. Uh, for example, there's a decision to distribute luxuries. And with this decision, you can increase amenities and immigration pull by 25%. There's also yet another one. Uh, if you go ahead and talk to the artists, you can go ahead and purchase an art piece. Uh, these cost only 600 energy and provide you with 15% extra amenities. So let's go ahead and enact this decision. Exhibit Art Monument. And now, if we update the clock, our amenities will go up by 4. Now granted, we are still in the negative for amenities, but it's not nearly as bad as it was before. Stability will improve significantly, and uh, we can afford to just continue building research labs. As far as diplomacy goes with other empires, you generally just want to, you know, be on the good side of everyone. Uh, generally, a couple hostile neighbors are alright. For example, these guys absolutely hate us and are hostile to us. However, since we have pretty decent star bases, they will likely not attack. And if they do, we'll be able to reinforce our fleets and uh, maybe reinforce from one of our shipyards. Also, as this type of empire, uh, commercial pacts are really quite the good deal. Uh, for example, getting these guys on board will get us 14 energy and 7 consumer goods per month. 
or just a low, low price of 0.25 influence. Uh, with this build, we have a lot of influence, and that is due to the plus 50% bonus to faction output. Uh, this provides us a very nice chunk of extra influence, and most edicts can just be auto-run and permanently renewed. Uh, this influence production will also help you out significantly if you choose to go habitats. Uh, now, generally, with the essential path, habitats are going to be the fifth essential perk that you choose. Uh, however, if you really desire an advance in tech, or you really desire food, you may actually choose to go for them earlier. Uh, if you plan on going habitats early, you generally want that as your second essential perk, but never your third. The problem is, the ecology project is just simply too powerful to pass up. The earliest you can get it is the third essential perk, and that is generally when I get it. That is because, you know, having an ecology and having massive consumer goods, or alloy, or unity output is extremely powerful, and uh, getting it is very, very worth it. Uh, generally what I do is I name one of my planets a future Yuko, and then just build the hell out of the city districts. Uh, I generally recommend going for smaller planets as your Kaminopoli, uh, however larger planets serve just as well. Uh, the advantage of smaller planets is that you're simply able to build the city districts on them faster than on larger worlds. Uh, with a size 25 world for example, and uh, 480 build time, we'll have to spend 36 years just building the city districts. And that's not to mention all the clearance and all the other districts that you're generally going to want to have so that your pops are not just, you know, sitting around twiddling their thumbs being clerks. Uh, clerks are generally not efficient enough to justify city districts as is, and so you will see that all of my worlds here have either zero or one city district. Uh, you do want some city districts to fix your housing issues, however going for too many of them is really pointless. Uh, they consume upkeep, they increase empire size, and they also provide pretty much useless clerk jobs. Granted, they do increase immigration pull, however you generally are not going to want to have any migration treaties with other empires, and uh, encouraging migration within your own empire is virtually pointless. Uh, one last thing about planets while I'm here, uh, is that you will generally want to unemploy your enforcer. Uh, if you can get a righteous ruler, that is just excellent, uh, because in that case you can just replace the enforcer on your planets with just the governor, and the enforcer can do something else. Uh, getting better technology is always important, and uh, that is what we're gunning for in this build. Uh, granted, you will want some unity along the way, and I generally recommend your 4th, 5th, or 6th building to be unity. Uh, that way you can keep up on unity, and even maybe be a little further than other empires in the game. Uh, this variant of the build will not be technocracy with unity production, however, if you are going technocracy, just spam the hell out of research, and uh, you'll just, you know, be alright. Uh, one last important thing that I want to mention is that there's a dynamic to population growth that is beyond just, you know, managing your population and making sure that they're perfect genetically, and that is the majority mechanic. If there is a majority of a certain species on a planet, they are more likely to grow. For example, this planet is dominated by the normal pops, and so the normal toothy burbs are more likely to grow on it. However, on planets with a lot more slaves, you will see a lot more slaves actually growing, and uh, managing this population dynamic is somewhat difficult if you don't know what you're doing, and a little bit cumbersome even if you do. Now, generally, if you're not going to get another species within your empire, such as a primitive or another species from another empire, uh, you will be at about 1 to 3 population as far as your slaves and your main pops go. Uh, that is a perfectly good ratio, and uh, if you want to increase the amount of slaves, you can of course just gene mod them and make them not slow breeders. Uh, in the late game, you generally will want to just restrict the growth of these pops outright uh, by just, you know, setting population controls. Uh, otherwise, everything that you do is completely up to you. I've pointed out some helpful tips to help along the way, however now it is time for your decisions. Uh, besides the Eucominopolis, all the other essential perks are pretty much up to you. Uh, personally, I prefer to go Technological Ascendancy by Ascension, Yuko by Ascension 2, Habitats, but you can also just go Habitats as your second Ascension, Yuko as your third, by 1, by 2, or you can even go Synthetic. Uh, with Machines, you will be a lot more optimized and you will be able to just convert all your population over to perfect, unyielding machines. Uh, the only problem with Machines is that with Xenophobe, they will not be able to receive full rights, and so to prevent a robotic rebellion and to actually, you know, be able to have them as rulers and such, uh, you will want to get rid of Xenophobe uh, one way or another, or else you will suffer. Uh, but anyways, that's going to be it for today. Uh, there is a traits tier list that's coming out rather soon. Uh, these videos are only made possible thanks to your support, so thank you so much guys, and of course, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.